Welcome to worship for the second Sunday of Advent, which is December 6th. Um, the song we just heard was O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, a very traditional hymn for Advent with very ancient words that go back about 500 years and um, happens to be one of my favorites. I know not everyone likes the um, chords and everything, but it, it is one of my favorites. Today, we will be celebrating communion together again, so if you need to get your communion elements, please go do that now. I'm also going to be lighting the Advent wreath, so if you wish to light your own wreath at home, feel free to participate with me. Um, as I said in the um, materials that went out in preparation for Advent, don't worry if you don't have the right color candles. Um, don't worry if you don't have enough candles. The important thing is to find a way to observe this spiritual discipline. Um, a couple of prayer concerns, one for St. Paul's Church, one for St. John's. Um, at St. Paul's, um, Barb Mills' brother-in-law, Rich, passed away um, Sunday, November 29th, so about a week ago. Um, we hold her and her family in our prayers at this time. And then Karen Young from St. John's has been hospitalized at St. Nick's. Um, she had um, a bleeding ulcer, and then they also discovered pneumonia, so she's recovering from that. Please hold her in prayer as well. At this time, let us draw our hearts, our minds, our spirits into the presence of the holy. Let us worship God, for this is indeed the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we light our Advent wreath, we begin with the candle from last week. The first Advent candle is the candle of hope. We light this candle for hope. The second candle is the candle of John the Baptist, who remembered Isaiah's prophecy of peace. <coughs> the prophet Isaiah wrote, For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Jesus is our peace. His peace is deep within us. It reaches out to friends and strangers and brings justice to our world. We light this candle of peace. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that even though there is no special star in the sky or angel singing, there is a real sense of your peace within us at Christmas time. Thank you that you are always with us, sharing in our good and bad times and giving us your peace. Amen. So our first scripture reading comes from 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15a. And for this first reading, I'm reading from the message version of the Bible. Listen to God's holy word. Don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years, a thousand years as a day. 
God isn't late with his promise as some measure of lateness. He is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. But when the day of God's judgment does come, it will be unannounced like a thief. The sky will collapse like a thunderous bang, everything disintegrating in a huge conflagration, earth and all its works exposed to the scrutiny of the judgment. Since everything here today might well be gone tomorrow, do you see how essential it is to live a holy life? Daily expect the day of God, for, eager for its arrival. The galaxies will burn up and elements will melt down that day, but we'll hardly notice. We'll be looking the other way, ready for the promised new heavens and the promised new earth, all landscaped with righteousness. So, my dear friends, since this is what you have to look forward to, do your very best to be found living at your best in purity and peace. Our second reading comes from the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God bless to our hearing, our understanding, and living these words of Holy Scripture. Amen. <coughs> if you watch any NFL game, you know something about the two-minute warning. The two-minute warning is given within two minutes that, when, that remain on the game clock in each half of a football game. And though that warning has become softened a bit in the age of television broadcast and new rules and what seems like endless stalling as the teams keep taking time outs, nevertheless, it still has some meaning and significance. The two-minute warning sounds this kind of alarm that tells some in the crowd, if your team is way, way ahead, now's the time to leave the stadium and beat the crowd home. And it tells the coaches, if you're way behind, now's the time to pull out your best play. And it tells the players, if you become begun to fade or kind of doze off, you best get your head in the game now. It's almost over. There's only two minutes left. 
And for those of us watching at home, this is usually when they take the commercial break. And if the game is kind of close and kind of tense, this is when we're left biting our nails or walking back and forth or perhaps covering up our eyes because we just can't take it anymore. This is also when exciting things happen, when the kicker makes a 50-yard kick to win the game, or the team decides to go for the two-point conversion. It's when the Hail Mary pass is made to win the game, like Aaron Rodgers did against the game against the Lions on December 3rd, 2015. With just six seconds remaining on the game clock, Aaron Rodgers threw a 61-yard pass to Richard Rodgers, who caught it in the end zone, and the game was won 27-23. May I suggest that the season of Advent is a little bit like a two-minute warning, or perhaps more accurately, a four-week warning. At just four weeks long, Advent is the shortest season of the Christian year, but it's also one of the most important. And just as this two-minute warning in a football game calls everyone to attention, calls them to their best game, our Advent warnings do something similar. During Advent, our scripture passages point not just to celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ on December 5th, but they also point to that day when Jesus will come again. Sometime in the future, near or far, we do not know. And as such, we're warned to get ready, to be prepared, to watch, to give life our best game up until the end of our days. The author of 2 Peter describes that day as being like a thief coming unannounced in the night. And he writes this about that day. Since everything here today might well be gone tomorrow, Live a holy life. Daily expect the day of God. So, what does it look like to live as if there is this two-minute warning going on? To live a holy life daily, as the author of Second Peter puts it. How do we live and give our best, not just during Advent, but throughout the year? In his book, The Life You've Always Wanted to Live, Reverend John Ortberg describes an evening when he was giving a bath to his three children. His son Johnny was sitting in the bathtub, kind of playing with a rubber ducky, his daughter, Laura, was safely out of the bathtub in her pajamas, and he was in the process of drying off Mallory. Now, she was out of the water, but she started doing what in the family they had started to call the d da day dance. The dance consisted of Mallory running round and round and round in circles and shouting at the top of her voice, D-da-de, D-da-de, D-da-de. John Ortberg describes that it's a relatively simple dance and that whenever Mallory got too excited that she could no longer hold it in, it would just kind of burst forth from her. It was her way to release the joy inside of her. And it was then that she would do this D-da day dance, expressing joy and excitement and love all at the same time. Well, on this particular occasion, John got irritated. Mallory, hurry up, he prodded his daughter. So she did. She hurried. 
but not in the way that John intended. Instead, Mallory started running around in circles ever faster and started chanting Dida Day even more rapidly. No, Mallory, that's not what I meant, snapped John. Stop with the Dida Day stuff and get over here right now. Hurry. It was at that moment that Mallory asked her dad a profound question. Why? Why did she have to hurry? John Artberg suddenly realized he had no good answer. He had nowhere to go. He had nothing planned that night, no church meetings, no sermon to work on. He was just so used to hurrying, trying to keep up with his own agenda, so trapped in moving from one thing to another, that here was life, here was joy, here was an invitation to the dance right in front of him. And he was missing it. So he got up, and he and Mallory did the DD dance together. What would you do if you knew your life was going to end tomorrow or the world was going to end? Would you reconcile with a long lost friend? or family member? Would you call up your friends and let them know how much you had appreciated their presence in your life? Would you finish that project that you've been promising your spouse to do for maybe years, knowing how important it was to them? Would you tell your children, maybe your parents, one last time, I love you. Would you do the Dida Day dance with your beloved, your children, as you twirled and danced with joy? What would you do? You see, most, if not all, details in life do not matter in the long run. What matters in the long run are our relationships with friend and foe alike. What matters is how we treat one another, how we talk about one another, how we support one another. What matters is how we approach each other, not just when we're present with each other, but when we are apart. To prepare for the coming of Christ into our heart is to tend to our relationships. To not wait until tomorrow to say words like, I forgive you, or please forgive me, or I love you, or thank you. Thank you for being a part of my life. What matters is our relationship to God's non-human creation and planet Earth, all of which has been given to us to tend and nurture, not destroy and abuse. What matters is our relationship to God, developing that relationship with our heavenly parent so that our will aligns with God's will. You see, friends, we take nothing with us to heaven except our relationships. One of the greatest Christmas presents I've ever heard of came from the Assembly of God Church in Plymouth, Wisconsin. The pastor there, Richard York, was part of an ecumenical clergy group to which I belonged years ago when I served at Bethel and Bethlehem. And one year, Richard and the associate pastor, whose name I can't remember, 
decided to give the gift of time and the gift of space to the church folk so that they could tend to their relationships and nurture and develop those at church and home. So that year, they planned nothing special for Christmas. So for the month before Christmas, there were no special concerts. There were no special vocal things going on. The choirs were given the month off. There were no bell, bell choir practices or vocal choir practices. They didn't have a Sunday school Christmas program that year. All church meetings were canceled for the month of December. No extra activities were planned. There were no Christmas cookie walks or Christmas bake sales. No Christmas caroling. No special offerings to promote. No decorating of the church for the holidays. That meant there was no Christmas tree in the church that year. Members were encouraged to use that extra time to spend with family and in service to the community. I remember how our clergy group gathered around this table all kind of looked at Richard in awe. And we all started kind of shaking our heads. We, we liked the idea, but we kept thinking, there's no way we could get away with that. And we wondered, would Richard get away with it? Would the people of this church start complaining that it just didn't feel like Christmas because all those activities and things were gone? Would they fire Richard in protest? Well, he did get away with it. And in fact, he still pastored there years later, so obviously they didn't fire him. And the church folk thought it was their best Christmas ever. Because that year, they had time to devote to family and friends. They had time to spend with and help the needy. They had time to simply sit and relax and enjoy the peace and beauty of the season. They had heard the two-minute warning, and they had stepped up their game as they tended to relationships near and far. In many ways, we've been given a similar gift with COVID-19. Because of the virus, many churches and families have scaled back their Christmas plans so that many of our churches are not having their normal Sunday school Christmas programs and pageants. The Christmas sales and walks are not there like normal years. Christmas caroling, the Christmas tree and holiday decorations are all scaled down. Candlelight services and Christmas communion, all these things have kind of been safely tucked away until next year. Running from store to store trying to find just the right gift, well, that's been replaced with lower expectations as we shop online. There is a quietness and a gentleness to Advent like no other Advent we've ever had, because we've been forced to slow down and do less. May I suggest that in that slowing down and doing less, we have a chance to acknowledge this Advent as a gift, much like Rich, Richard's church years ago saw that time as a gift. Seeing these scaled-back observances as a gift, a gift of time and place to tend relationships, a time to just sit and relax and enjoy the beauty and joy of the season, a chance to hear the two-minute warning and truly understand the finite nature of our lives 
and truly understand what's really important in life. My hope and prayer for all of us is this Advent is a time when we see it as a gift, a gift to nurture and tend to our relationships in a way perhaps we've not had time to do before. My hope and prayer for you is that you're able to simply rest in the beauty and the gentleness of this season. May God bless your Advent journey. Amen. For our closing prayer, your response when I go like this is, be with us. So let us pray. Emmanuel, humanity waits in darkness, longing for your light. In the center of darkness, rekindle our hope as we wait for peace in the midst of the many divisions that exist, not just in our country, but in the world. Be with us. As we pray for those most affected by the coronavirus, be with us. As we pray for the health and welfare of our communities, be with us. As we pray for the members of our church, be with us. As we pray for kindness and community, be with us. Restore and set right our relationships, Replace the darkness in our hearts with your light and joy. Let your word set alight the hope the world needs to bring to life your love and justice. Amen. On the night on which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to the disciples to all for all to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. God, as we wait in silence and wait in hope, bless these gifts of bread and wine, fruit of the vine and work of human hands, that they may 